it's a delight to be able just to share the concluding chapters of the book of Nehemiah. And before I begin, I wish to uh, announce and remind and reiterate the new guidelines from the Interfaith Council. They have given new churches new guidelines with regard to our gathering. And we wish to say that children below six years, children below six years, we are asking that they stay at home. We are also asking for our senior citizens, senior citizens, those above 65, we ask that we stay at home. Those are the guidelines we are being given. The other guideline we are receiving is that our services will be one and a half hours, a full one and a half hours, and we will oblige and commit to that guideline. And so, Pastor Rosalind, I wish just to thank you for coming back, coming back to where I wish to start. I wish to start even as we receive those guidelines. The very truth about, or one of the things I've gleaned from the book of Nehemiah is that like all other stories in the Bible, is the truth that God is making a name for himself. God is making a name for his, himself as the children of Israel. His people, his nation, need to remember who he is. God is making a name for himself. And the book of Nehemiah is also reminding us that God hears and answer prayer. Not only does he hear and answer prayer, that throughout his history, even today, this is his story. It is his story unfolding. His plans for mankind from the beginning to create us in his own image and to fellowship with him are still the same plans he's had for us and with us uh, today. Even in the time of Nehemiah, which was 400 years before Christ, he is revealing himself. He is unfolding his plan. This is his story. His plan is being revealed to us. Not just that we may just know him, but that we may glorify him. And that by knowing him, knowing his characters that we've been reminded today, that we may trust him. That we may trust him in everything. Trust him with our day to day. Trust him with our tomorrow. Trust him even with our yesterday. Friends, in God or with God, no experience goes wasted. No experience goes wasted because it is his plan unfolding. And that is why I believe Nehemiah is a part of rebuilding the wall, the city of the Lord, which was known as the, the, the city of God, God of Israel. His name is being made known. Friends, the rebuilding of the uh, wall of Jerusalem in a record 52 days showed us the readiness of Nehemiah and we were very able led through that preparedness Nehemiah went through. We are also uh, reminded that he resourced and how he resourced. We also remember that he had a strategy, he had preparations to make. There we also saw that he had a wise response to opposition. And God enabled Nehemiah to do so. Last week, we were very ably led by our very own Reverend Kabibi, how the children of Israel renewed their passion and, and commitment to the reading and keeping of the Torah. And that this was what God intended for them. From beginning of creation, God, through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, to Jesus, even, even now for the church, until his second coming, he's making his name known. He's making his name known to each one of us. And through Nehemiah, we see he works through ordinary people to do extraordinary things. God works through ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Nehemiah, we see as a servant who he gave wisdom and strategies. He even resourced. And in this book, we see how he was God-fearing and how he walked, even in difficult times, knowing that he was not alone. And like every story we know, a good story has characters. And the character 
in the book of Nehemiah, as we've looked at, is of course God, the man Nehemiah, the people of Israel. Then there is Tobias and Sanballat, those who oppose the rebuilding of the wall. And of course, there are other people that are mentioned. But it's very interesting in this story that the twist comes at the end. Very interesting. And allow me to just go through, have an overview for each one of us. And I'd like to make a key point for us to note that Nehemiah is fulfilling God's promises to his people, the nation of Israel. Nehemiah is fulfilling God's promises to the nation of Israel through this book. So today we'll look at three themes. And if you're writing down, and I must confess to the quest team, I have thoroughly enjoyed the worksheet the children have been given. I even wish that our adult church could be given this guideline. But if you're writing down on your phone, here are the three points that I see are general themes that are occurring in the last three chapters of Nehemiah. The first is Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest, a sign of our Christian faith. Sabbath rest, a sign of our Christian faith. The second is service to God. Service to God is a sign of our love. Service to God is a sign of our love. And third, separation is a sign of our identity. The children of Israel were asked to separate themselves because this was a sign of their identity, that they were children of God. And in rebuilding of the temple, Jerusalem is not only just restoring the physical structure, they are also being urged and encouraged and reminded to return to the full covenant principles that God gave Moses in Deuteronomy. And these were some of the things they were asked to obey. They were asked to fully obey with all their hearts by loving him more than any other activity, relationship, achievement, or possession. They were asked to obey with, his, with their will, with everything that is of them, to fully commit and to commit to God completely. They were also asked to obey with their minds so that they may seek God and seek with his word. Then they were also asked not only to obey the commands in their minds, with their hearts, and, and with all that they are, their will, but also to obey God with their body, recognizing that all and everything, every part of them was God-given, not just for, for pleasure, but for fulfillment of the same according to his rules and not their rules. They were also commanded to obey with their finances, their resources, the truth being that God owns everything. Lastly, they were asked to obey, fully aware that their future was driven by God. They were not their own, on their own. God was ahead of them. Another reason I think that Nehemiah, the civil engineer, who served in the king's palace as a cupbearer, was favored by God, the king, and even his, the Jews, his fellow Jews, returned to Jerusalem was also to reinstate the worship of the one and true God. His return was to reinstate the worship of the one and true God, which I believe is evidenced by the Sabbath rest they were called to as a sign of, of their faith. The service they were called to as a sign of their love and the separation they are called to as a sign of their identity. Let us generally review chapter 11. Here, the walls of Jerusalem are complete, and Nehemiah has done all he could, gathering, but he notices that the city is still weak and despicable, and his concern was that there were no people living in the city. So in this chapter, Nehemiah accounts in detail how lots were cast, people were chosen to go and live in the city. He begins with those who were there initially, the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. Then he moves on and says the priests and the Levites come into the city. And then the other villages were populated by the other tribes. And interesting to note that now the city of Jerusalem is populated with the rest of the family so that it becomes a, like a, a, a hub or the main center 
where the courts of justice, the capital city, where courts of justice were and, and judgments were declared. So it becomes a very significant city at this point. They also were those who came on their own and, and they offered and they served to come on their own so that the city may return back to its initial glory. It's interesting to note that Psalm 122 verse 6 says of these people who returned, that those who prosper live in Zion. So Jerusalem became a beautiful city, one that they wanted to return to its former glory. It's also interesting to note that in the time of Jesus, by the time Jesus is coming back, the tribe of Benjamin and Judah have become such a big tribe and such a big nation that they are recognized even in scripture. Only evidence to say that God is fulfilling his, his promise that he made to the forefathers of the children of Israel, namely Abraham. Now, of course, Nehemiah's concern was because the city was, would be easily attacked, so he encouraged the people. But it's not worthy to say, or some commentaries have said, that people were afraid to go back to Jerusalem because they would be ridiculed by the foreigners and those who did not obey uh, or fear the Lord. The other thing was that the requirement to move needed that they rebuild their homes and rebuild their businesses. So it wasn't automatic. A third thing was that the, the children of Israel were afraid to go back to Jerusalem because there would be peer pressure and then they would have to obey the law, strict law, because their neighbors would see that they were not obeying the law. And that is why they were afraid and Nehemiah is intentional to do this in chapter 11. Again, chapter 12 continues to list out details of the chief priests and the Levites and even the names in that, in that chapter until verse 27 where the dedication uh, begins. And then again, I want to refer to our children's quest uh, sheet. May I ask, one of the questions I didn't understand because there's a part you have to fill, what I do not understand. And let's talk about this. One of the things I didn't understand was why did the Bible and why has God allowed the scripture to detail people by name? To detail people by name. What is it, importance is it to us? So why the account of names detailing the sec, uh, settlement? I wish to suggest to you that the truth was that, like Nehemiah knew, he prays even to God in Nehemiah chapter 13, 14. He says, oh Lord, remember me. And the truth is that God never forgets. God never forgets. So it is obvious that the detailing of those names was for the children of Israel who easily forgot. And for later on, those who read the account that they do not forget. At this point, I was very encouraged by a lesson I learned there. That God has a short memory of our sin, but has a very long memory of what we do in obedience. I wish to say that again. God never forgets. The account of names that were for his people were for those who had short memories, the children of Israel who would easily forget. Yet it is encouraging to know that God does not remember our sins. Scripture details that. He will always remember our good works. Hebrews 6.10 reminds us, God is not unjust. He will not forget the good you have done for his people and his, the love you have shown for his people. And we are encouraged to continue. So friends, God never forgets what we do, but he forgive, forgets our sin. Scripture continues to record in Malachi that those who fear the Lord, this is Malachi 3.16, those who fear the Lord talked with each other. Did you know there is a record of what you speak as God-fearing people in heaven? Because the scripture is detailing that a record is written, the Lord listened and he heard. And a scroll of remembrance was written in the presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored him. Secondly, Another reason I think that God details for us the names of the children of Israel and the account how they returned family by family, tribe by tribe, name by name, was that this was to show us evidence that he's performing 
is completing and performing, fulfilling his promise. Psalms verse 112 tells us, The righteous shall be an everlasting remembrance. Let the memory of the righteous, the just, be blessed and be perpetuated. We are indebted to the fathers of faith in the book of Hebrews and who tell us and how we know how they feared God and obeyed him to fulfill God's plans and purposes in his children and for us to know and remember. Thirdly, I believe the details of names was not random or, or, or by chance. It was so that you and I could be stirred up you and I can be motivated, encouraged to do the same. As God says, those are my people. Those are my people. You are my people. I want you to know them. And to know them and to know that I know them. God is detailing these names of these people so that we may know that he knows them and that we too may, may know them. And there are quite a few genealogies in scripture, aren't there? And I must confess, when I read the Bible cover to cover, there are some chapters I just gloss over. But I'm reminded those names are to remind me that God is fulfilling his promises. And that's why I strongly believe that the book of Nehemiah, and specifically the consistency to which Nehemiah is achieving his task, is to remind them that the worship of the one and true God is evidenced by Sabbath rest, is evidence by service to God, is evidence by separation. Allow me to quickly just look through that this morning. Sabbath rest as a mark of faith. You see, after some time, the scripture records, Nehemiah returned back to Pasha. And, and when he returned back, he, he came back after some time, some people have said maybe after 12 years. But he observed a man of Judah treading on the wine press on a Sunday. Basically, he was working. Business happening in Jerusalem, that was unheard of. Nehemiah quickly reminds them that this was the very reason that they were forced into calamity in the first place. That they disobeyed God's commands. God had commanded that we rest, that the children of Israel rest on the Sabbath. And it was not just because when he created after the sixth day, the seventh day he rested. That was not only the reason. I wish to remind us that this Sabbath rest was included in covenant promise. Exodus 16, 23 says that the children of Israel were not to work on the Sabbath. They were not even to cook meals. Why? God knew that a busy lifestyle full of daily schedules of the usual mundane things, will distract his people from worshiping him. It is easy to let work, family responsibilities, recreation crowd our schedules so tightly that we don't have time to worship. Exodus 31, 12 is telling us, Sabbath was, not, was also a sign of God between his people, for the generations to come, so that they may know that he is the Lord who makes them holy and that he is the one and only, only true God whom they should worship. Friends, I wish to remind us that Sabbath rest was a mark of the Christian faith. Secondly, I wish to remind us a very beautiful truth that I've come to learn, that the Sabbath rest was as a super, a picture of Christ coming back. The big deal here is, if we don't rest on the Sabbath day, is that we are then saying, what did Christ do to them? In other words, what did he, we are questioning what he did for us. You see, friends, Christ is our Sabbath day rest. He did all the work on Calvary. You and I need not to work for our salvation. You and I need to operate from a space of rest. We only need to put our faith on Jesus, who is our salvation, who paid it all, who did all the work. And scripture encourages us to enter the Sabbath rest. Jesus did all the work. And we know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, for we are saved 
by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. The Sabbath rest was also representative of Christ, who is our rest. Therefore, the command to rest, God was putting it and forcing it and reminding the children of Israel, even in Nehemiah's time, that most times, whether we like it or not, money can be a conflict in our worship and our honor of God. So trade was forbidden in the city. In fact, Nehemiah enforced a curfew. So if you think curfews only started in our day, even in the days of Nehemiah, he enforced a curfew to the point that the evening before Sabbath, gates were locked and nobody was allowed to come in. He even enforced the Levites to come and, and stand guard in this time, remembering that only God and God alone is to be worshipped. And it's interesting that he's reminding the children of Israel to obey the Sabbath rest. And even before that, Ezra, like we were told earlier, had come and restored the temple of Jerusalem. And temple tax had been restored. Offering and feasts had been restored. This was how God wanted to be worshipped in the uh, Old Testament. First fruits were dedicated to God. And also those who learned that the Levites had turned back into worship. Nehemiah was, of course, upset and therefore reinstituting what God has started. Now, in the Old Test New Testament, this practice has not been carried over where we are doing offerings of different kinds. However, Scripture is reminding us in Nehemiah that the first portion, be it of our time, our treasure, our talent needs to be offered to God. Tithe is given to support the Levites and those who worked in the temple. This principle is still at work even today in the house of God and should not be overlooked. I need reminders, friends, that God is intentional while he's reconstructing Jerusalem and now in the book of Nehemiah, the broken down walls. He wants his people to remember that he and he alone is the true God. He and he alone is the one to be worshipped through our Sabbath rest. Then let me quickly go through what I believe is the significant factor or, or theme coming out in the book of Nehemiah with regard to service. So when now the, the people have, uh, the city has been populated, Nehemiah then dedicates the wall. And dedicating of this wall was done with pomp and, and, and glamour and a lot of celebration, a lot of singing. He even calls back, you know, the singers who would come and they, they, the scripture records that they surrounded, you know, the walls and went round singing, just like it was in the times of David. And even the, the instruments that were taken when uh, uh, the city was taken into captivity, they were brought back in the time of Nehemiah. So dedication of the city walls was characterized with such joy, um, a great anticipation, uh, singing and praising and celebration as it was in the beginning to remind them that God and God alone is the one to be worshipped. And may I ask this question? And for those of us writing the children, could you just ask this question with me? How am I going to rebuild my life? Is there a need for me to rebuild my life? How am I going to rebuild my life? The life of my family members where there are broken down walls, the life of our community, the life of our nation and our church. How will I do this? Allow me to continue to say that God is asking you and I to be part of building, to be part of rebuilding, not just post-COVID, but for posterity, to remind the generations to come that God and God alone is to be worshipped. There is no other one, there is no other true God other than Jehovah, the one and only. Even in our service, our service that is a response to his love and our love. Let me then take some time to what I feel is the crunch and the twist that comes in the 13th chapter of Nehemiah. You see, it's interesting, Nehemiah has finished dedicating the temple. But when he returns back, 
he actually goes back to his master. And they say his master was a reluctant master who did not want Nehemiah to go away for long periods. So that tells us that Nehemiah not only served the king with excellence, even as he served God, but it is stated that he comes back. Nehemiah has to come back to address grievances that had cropped up in the book of uh, the 13th chapter. Now, some of these grievances had crept in his absence. It was like absence, the children of Israel were saying, absence in mind is absence, you know, absence in presence is absence in mind. And the Bible records that at this point, the children of Israel had gone back to intermarry with the Moabites and the Ammonites. The most interesting thing is that Ezra, or rather the, the, the temple uh, priest, had brought in one who was not allowed to be in the temple, and that was Tobias. It, he even was so upset that the Levites had gone back to the fields to, to fend for themselves, and he reinstitutes that. The other thing he does is ask the people to be consecrated. He's so upset that he asked the people to be consecrated. Scripture even recalls, he almost put a hand on them to show how upset he was because of the disobedience that had crept in. Now, Nehemiah must have been very discouraged because the people at this time have returned on their promises. Remember, it's just a short while before that these people had asked for the word of God to be read to them, to be reminded they had rededicated themselves. But here, after a very short time, he comes back and finds that there are children born of intermarriages, that they could not speak their languages other than those of the foreign gods. Therefore, he instructs that consecration happens. Scripture records that he even pulls their hair and makes them, you know, swear and, and take an oath in God's name. And not to, not to take, the oath they were to take was not to make their children to, get, to intermarry or their sons and daughters to intermarry with other tribes who did not obey and love God. This was so drastic in my view. Imagine Nehemiah pulling out hair, asking people to take oath. What anger. But he's reminding them that Solomon made the same mistakes. And he's reminding them that the greatest of kings in Israel fell because of the influence of unbelievers. The principle here, I wish to say, is that sin must be identified and dealt with quickly. Sin must be identified and dealt with quickly. It will, if not dealt with, it will overpower and bring even the strongest man down. Maybe I ask the third question. What is the big deal? What was wrong with the children of Israel intermarrying? I wish to suggest to us that the children of Israel had forgotten the covenant of God made by Moses. The covenant promise was their identity. They were to remember that they had a father called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And friends, as you read through scripture, these statements are repeated over and over again. Our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This covenant was their identity. And if they lost this identity, then whose were they? Friends, God is using the book of Nehemiah to remind us that he is going to fulfill his purposes to the very end. None of them will not happen in his name and in his watch. So the covenant promise was their identity. The second thing was that they were asked not to give their daughters to marriage because those who they were giving to did not worship the true God. It is very interesting that later on in the New Testament, Paul writes, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Allow me to just remind us that the worship of the one and true God is evidenced by 
Sabbath rest that is symbolic of our faith. Secondly, the worship of the one and true God is evidenced by our service to God that is done in love. Third, the worship of the one and true God is evidenced by our separation, which is a sign of our identity. Allow me to just demonstrate this quickly. And with the little time that I have to show us how I think the children of Israel, after such a very short time, had forgotten the word of God. And you know, in this season, I have uh, in many ways doubled up to me many things. So I am learning that there are many ways to, to learn. And um, give me a minute. So one of the things I was, was a, a what, what do they call? A stay-home mom. <laughs> and not only a stay-home mom, but a teacher. And uh, this teacher learned many things. So I want to illustrate to us why I think the children of Israel forgot, they forgot the word of God that they had read. Now, many of you have done biology, so I'm trying to look the part of a biology teacher. Okay, so that when I come to this lab, I will be careful. Now, you know there are, in the animal kingdoms, there are many animals. really have to look the part, don't I? And there are many animals in the animal kingdom. So recently I learned, can I be well heard? Okay. Recently I learned that there are animals called amphibians. And these amphibians have special characteristics. The truth is that they live in, in water. And uh, children, I want to say, don't do this at home. <laughs> and if you do, do it with a parent. And I want to illustrate to you how I think the children of Israel slowly forgot. They forgot what they had been taught. So amphibians live in, live in water. Now this amphibian is, I put it in water. And uh, turn and face the people, say hello. And... Uh, it is doing very well in water. But if, and you know that there is global warming, eh? if I close this jar and I do it for some time, what will happen? Yes, why? Because all animals need water. The other thing, and normally in a lab, that is called the, which is the control. Yes. So if I also do something else, this is another amphibian, and because of glo global warming, there are many things that happen and, and other external influences. And so I would want to do something to its environment. I'm told amphibians are very ad adaptable to their environment. And so I want to introduce to us, okay, I want to introduce to us several colors. Can we do one more? I want to introduce dyes. And this dyes, Zimesema has it talking. I beg your pardon? I want to introduce dyes, and these dyes need to come out. Yes. So I want to change that amphibia's environment. Okay? And do you notice what's happening? I'm glad I picked color green. Okay? That's our environment. That amphibian will continue changing to green. But I can continue influencing it with other dyes.
and now it, it will become quite a colored amphibian. And I can keep adding. An introduction of foreign or different dyes will change, and it will just keep adapting, okay? So it will keep adapting. So I've left that one, it's breathing, it's doing all things. Then I have this one. I have this one, which is very alive. Ooh, don't stick on me. And this one, I'll also put it in water. And allow that it changes its environment. But not only because of global warming, we know that this environment needs to change. And amphibians also adapt to, that is why I wore the glasses, Amphibians also adapt to temperature. And so you know that if I put hot water, this amphibian would have jumped on me. Why? Because it's running away from that unfavorable environment. But now this is room temperature. The amphibian is actually breathing and just enjoying. But if I continually just introduce a new level of temperature, what happens? It continues to adapt. Say now the temperature is at 10 degrees. I can hold 10 degrees, Nimeshika, you know, ovens. And so now maybe it's turning to 20. And I'm just introducing heat. You know what the amphibian is doing? It's adapting. In fact, now it's looking at me and saying, bring it on. And continues to change. And say by now, it is sort of reaching boiling point, okay? Sort of reaching boiling point. What is that amphibian doing? Adjusting. Before short while, and I know we don't have time for this, what do you think happens to that amphibian? It dies, why? The temperature has reached levels that it can no longer adjust to. It can no longer adjust to. And so, this is what I believe the children of Israel were doing. They just slowly acclimatized. They slowly acclimatized. They become, became the colors of those who were around them, foreigners. And some of them would even try to escape. But the more they escape, the more they are pulled down because of those cultural practices, those things that God has said do not do and other gods, and the practices of other cultures. And those cultures eventually did what? Suffocated them. But the more frightening thing was how this happened so gradually that they didn't realize that the changing and the worshiping of other gods, including and accommodating other people who are not God-fearing, they ended up warming and adjusting and compromising and changing to the point that, that the Lord was upset. Now, the truth about the end of Nehemiah is that it doesn't end with a redemptive story. It does not end in a way that 400 years later, Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the one and only son of God, was able to come and change this fact. The fact that the children of Israel would permanently stop worshiping other gods. That, for me, was such an amazing truth. That the truth that bulls, sheep, goats could not stop the children of Israel from sinning. Even when they offered sacrifice in the renewed temple and in a renewed city. Friends, the good news for us, 4,000 years, or is it 2,000 years later, Jesus, the perfect son of God, made an end to this conflict, made an end to this re uh, rebellion, made an end to our separation from God, that they were to stop sinning, they were to stop 
accommodating and acclimatizing to the changing environment. Friends, you and I are made perfect in Christ Jesus. You and I can be called the holy city, the city of God, the holy people. And God is in trust in instructing us even today to be holy as he's holy. God is instructing you and I to be set apart as he requires us to set us apart. You know, it didn't look important for them that even the priest invited a Moabite, Tobiah, to be part of the temple. And do you know why God was so upset through Nehemiah to show and demonstrate how angry he was? That Nehemiah threw out his things from that room. The truth was that Nehemiah was needing, or the children of Israel needed to remember that when they were coming, traveling to the promised land, they passed through the land of the Moabites. They passed through the land of the Amorites. And those people refused them entry. Those people refused them passage. Those people refused them food to the point that God promised that they will never enter the temple. They will never enter his holiness. God was so jealous for his people that he wanted the him and he wanted them to know that he is the one and only true God. That there is no other God that they should worship. That they should be worshiping him with Sabbath rest. That they should be worshiping him in service. And they should be worshiping as they set themselves apart for him. Set themselves apart. Today I believe that even us, we are slowly being influenced. I have looked through the ages and through my short time alive and seen how other external factors are influencing us, are influencing me. Call them media, call them philosophies, call them cultures. But slowly, I have warmed up to these new cultures. Slowly, I have warmed up to these new belief systems, slowly I have accommodated, looking like it is progressive. But the sad truth is, the danger here is, we do that at the expense of compromising the word of God, of disobeying God, so that then our worship is not true worship. Our worship is not from a Sabbath rest. Our worship is not a service to God. Neither are we separate. Neither are we separate. Paul in Romans is telling us to put to death the things of the flesh. And what are the deeds of the flesh? What are the things of the flesh? Lying, stealing, greed, cheating, adultery, wild living, drunkenness, witchcraft, murder, idolatry, envy, arrogance, self-ambition, jealousies, discord, lust, hatred, impurity, sexual immorality, Galatians goes on and on and on. Nehemiah is reminding us to worship the one and only true God is evidenced by separation as a sign of our identity. The Sabbath rest as a sign of our faith, service to God as a sign of our love. Nehemiah made bold proclamations upon the people. Nehemiah was not only faithful, but his faith had action. Nehemiah was also courageous. So dear, today I want us to call us to make bold resolves. Bold resolves. To resolve to be ready to build the walls that are broken down in our families because of accommodating and changing even that which is not of God. To be bold and ready to build our families, our church, our community. Today I call us to resolve, to be resourceful in our family, to teach the word to our children and our children's children so that they may be having a godly heritage. I call us to be bold in our community, to be resourceful, to our church, our, our nation. I'm inviting us to resolve to respond to opposition in prayer like Nehemiah did with wisdom, 
humility, courage, a boldness, and a persuasion, knowing that God and God alone is to be worshipped. Today, I'm calling us to resolve, to be renewed by the hearing, the reading, the studying, the memorizing, and meditating on the word of God so that we may be transformed and renewed, that we will not be impacted by a changing environment. Friends, I'm calling us to resolve, to stand in faith, in obedience, no matter what the opposition. Today, I ask us to resolve, to be fervent in our service. And times will come when our service with God will be tested. We will do it in spite of, not because it's, it's a convenience. Resolve to have fervent service to God. Lastly, I ask to us to resolve to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. By daily putting on the full armor of God that we may stand against the devil's schemes. By putting on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, and to pray with all kinds of prayers. Friends, resolve to keep alert because of our changing environment. Let us pray. Father, how I pray for a boldness like Nehemiah had. How I pray for our boldness to act, that our faith will have action as we rebuild what is our lives, as we rebuild what is our families, as we rebuild our communities, our society, even our nation, not just post-COVID, but for posterity. Father, I pray for our courage and the wisdom. I pray for discernment an understanding of the times in your church. I pray for the strengthening of our faith, that even when our faith may be tested, we will stand because you are with us and you are fulfilling the promises you made to our fathers of faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that we too are children of covenant. We too are children of promise because you love us with an everlasting love. So, Lord, we pray and we know you hear us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.